Gold prices have crashed. Gold prices have crashed. Since 2011, gold has plummeted more than 25%, and the worst may not yet be over. The Profit Strategy Newsletter at ETFGuide.com warned its subscribers the gold bubble would pop, and it has. Our gold alert given to subscribers in early 2013 resulted in a 500% gain. What happens next in the gold market will shock the entire globe. Join today at ETFGuide.com and get a $50 bonus by using promo code SAVE50. You're listening to the Index Investing Show. This is America's only weekly program focused on the important stock and bond indexes and the financial products that track them. And now presenting your host, Ron DeLegend. Ron DeLegend. Welcome to the program. Great to have you with us. Coming up on today's show is more pain ahead for long-term bond investors. It's been a painful year for anyone that's held bonds, especially long-term bonds. So we're going to talk about what looks what 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 the future looks like and whether more pain is ahead for owners of long-term bonds. Also coming up is Smart Beta really smart. You know, smart beta strategies or fundamental indexing, whatever you want to call it, quant investing, especially within an ETF wrapping, are now being touted as a new dynamic, a better way of investing in securities. But is that really true? Is that really true? So we're going to take a look at smart beta and see if it's really smart or if it's just another one of Wall Street's brilliant marketing pitches. If you'd like to join us to talk about a particular stock, mutual fund, ETF, or investment strategy, how about a 2013 tax loss selling and harvesting some of your losses, offsetting your gains, and uh, we'll talk about that along with uh, my program guest, Christian Magoon. He's the founder of a company called Yield Shares, and they have a ETF uh that uh, focuses on high income strategies he'll be joining us um, in the third segment of today's program so stay tuned for that 877-711-5611 is the number we're here talking about the birds and the bees of successful investing one of the purposes of this show is not just to inform you it's not just to entertain you and educate you i mean it's all of that and more but it's also to help you have an investing philosophy, a correct perspective on how to put your financial interests first. That's what it's all about. You come first. And there's no better way to do that than with index investing, which is a very simple strategy. It's all about building your core portfolio, building the foundation of your portfolio, of your investments, your IRA, your 401k plan, your family investments on a solid foundation of low-cost index funds or ETFs. That's what it's all about. That's where you begin. That's your priority. After you've taken care of that priority of building your portfolio, the core, the foundation, your serious money on low-cost index funds and index ETFs, if you've got extra money, if you got play money, risk capital, Money that you want to play around with, investing in individual stocks, venture capital, Bitcoin, or whatever other crazy and insane ideas come to your head, do that with your risk capital, your non-core investments, the core investments, the foundation, the serious money should be indexed to the market. 877-711-5611, that is the number. This is a live program. We're here. You can also tweet the program. At Index Show is my Twitter handle. A little bit later, we'll also get into some of your emails, tweets, comments. Let's take a look at uh, new home sales jumping. Now, sales for new single-family homes rose just over 25% in the month of October. Now, that was a rebound. Uh, the month of September, the previous month, was pretty weak. But uh, this jump that we saw in s new single-family homes for the month of October marked the sharpest month-over-month -month increase in more than three decades. So uh, home builders, as a group, uh, continue to hold their ground. XHB, which is the Spider 
S&P Home Builders ETF over the past six months has traded pretty much flat. And uh, that particular ticker symbol, by the way, uh, for those in our audience wondering, ticker symbol XHB is one of the ETFs that tracks the home building sector. Uh, you've also got ticker symbol ITB, which is an iShares ETF that does basically the same thing. And so that particular ETF, XHB, like I said, uh, over the past six months has been pretty much flat. But over the past year, it's had a really nice run, climbing just over 22%. That's XHB, uh, Spider S&P Home Builder ETF. Now, taking a look in other areas of the markets, we are going to talk a little bit about bonds. And I think it's very important. Financial damage right now is being done to long-term holders of uh, holders of long-term uh, debt or long-term bonds. And it's really, in my view, going to get worse, especially as interest rates uh, continue their trajectory toward moving higher. So we're going to talk a little bit about this. But the thing here is when you look at the 10-year yield on U.S. Treasuries now at 2.88%. Now, I think it was the third quarter we danced with 3% briefly. It was extremely brief, but what will a interest rate, what will a yield of above 3% mean for bond investors? What, what, what will it mean for financial markets? Well, this is what Bloomberg had to say this past week, quote, Treasury 10-year notes should yield 3.5% based on, upon growth and inflation forecasts and it impacted the Federal Reserve's asset purchase program instead of today's 2.85%, according to J.P. Morgan. Benchmark German bond yields, that's pretty much the equivalent of U.S. Treasuries for Germany, should be at 2.2% versus 1.75%, while similar maturing uh, U.K. gilts should yield 3.3% instead of 2.85%. End of quote. That's from Bloomberg. And so that would... In, that. Right there, if that was to occur, we're looking at another half a percent increase, roughly, from current from current uh, levels for bonds. And as most of our listeners know, regular listeners and the new listeners should know, that the relationship between interest rates and bond prices is inverse or opposite. So when rates rise, bond prices fall. And that's the environment that we're currently in right now. We've got the 10-year yield over the past year soaring more than 72% toward 2.88%. And it's been a, a really, really bad time, not so much for short-term, holders of short-term bonds, but particularly the longer-term bonds because of the fact that they are the most sensitive to increases in interest rates and that's one of the reasons why we see long-term bonds performing so poorly. Over the past year, TLT, which tracks long-term U.S. Treasuries, we're talking about maturities of 20 years or longer, down 17%. Will we get to that bear market threshold? You know, the official definition of a bear market is a 20% decline from peak to trough. So will we see that with long-term U.S. Treasuries? Well, we are well on our way we are well on our way and another theme well, i've highlighted this in my december etf profit strategy newsletter which is available to, to all, everyone go get a copy at etfguide.com but this is a mega investment theme we've talked about not just recently but over the past six months higher rates lower bond prices this is an un unbelievable opportunity for those of you that want to make some capital gains and grow your money this has been the trade that you should be making is to short long-term treasuries. That's been a great trade. Ticker symbol TMV, that's the direction daily 20-plus uh, year treasury bear 3X shares. Now, this particular ETF, again, the ticker symbol TMV uses triple daily inverse uh, leverage, inverse performance to long-term U.S. treasuries, and, and it, is, it has been a great trade. The only time I... I really encourage our our audience to ever use leverage is in a sharply trending market. 
That could be sharply trending up or sharply trending down. But right now, we've got a sharply trending down market in long-term U.S. Treasuries, and that's been a good trade for TMV. Over the past one year, TMV is up over 41%. That's a nice return. This is the Index Investing Show. I'm Ron DeLegge. More when we return. I'll be right back. The Index Investing Show with Ron DeLegge. Seven 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 eleven fifty six eleven. That is the number. Please join us. We're here. You want to talk about a particular stock, mutual fund, ETF? I'm game. Let's do some trivia, and uh, we'll also do. We'll get into some of your emails and uh, your tweets a little bit later. We've got Christian Magoon warming up in the bullpen. He's the founder of a company called the Yield Shares. Ticker symbol Y Y Y is the ticker symbol and that particular ETF focuses on high income strategies and we're going to talk about uh, how it's able to get such a juicy yield yield on YYY right now is around eight and a half percent so we're going to talk about that particular ETF along with other income strategies and some year-end moves that you can be making in order to reduce your tax liabilities we talked about it actually we've been discussing over the past several weeks tax loss harvesting this is the time of year that you do this and once january 1st strikes pretty much too late to be doing tax loss harvesting for 2013 so 877-711-5611 that's a number let's do some trivia uh, on today's show and uh, the question is this the question is this how did the u.s stocks perform on the news that the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. That was on December 8th, 1941. How did U.S. stocks perform on news that the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor? Was it A, stocks were down 8.2%, B, stocks were down 4.37%, or C, stocks were up 3.4%? So what's the correct answer? You've got three choices. Is it A, B, or C? Were stocks A, down 8.2%, B, down 4.3%, or C, up 3.4%? That was on 19, 1941, December 8th, Japanese news that the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. How did U.S. stocks react? If you know the answer to that question, 877-711-5611, you'll get a signed copy of my book, the Wall Street Coloring Book. Yeah, you never even knew that there was such a book. Well, there is. And the winner will get a signed copy of that book. <laughs> the Wall Street Coloring Book, jam-packed with plenty of horse laughs for you and the family. So let's talk about Smart Beta. Is it really smart? Smart Beta basically are formulas that are used, they're basically the intersection of active and passive investing. The goal of smart beta strategies is to beat traditional market cap weighted indexes, okay? Now, smart beta strategies in the investment world generally fall into two camps. You've got indexes that use one-dimensional or simple formulas like equal weighting all of the stocks within an index. For example, the Guggenheim S&P 500 equal weighted ETF, ticker symbol RSP, this particular fund, all it does is it weights all 500 stocks within the S&P 500 equally as opposed to by their market size like the traditional S&P 500 does. So that's one way or one strategy that Smart Beta uses. Another strategy is a little bit more complicated, weighting stocks within a portfolio using a multiplicity of complex factors, not just equal weighting, but Things like book value, cash value, dividends, and other financial metrics. So these are what they call smart beta strategies. So smart beta promoters have said that they have found a new and better breed of investing compared to traditional indexing. So is that true? 
or is it just an innovative word trick for something else? Here's what James Montier, he's a member of GMO's asset allocation team. Here's what he had to say in a recent paper, quote, when these strategies, he's talking about smart beta, when these strategies are corrected for their exposure to value and small cap stocks, they exhibit no statistically significant outperformance compared to the cap weighted benchmark. In other words, the fact that smart beta has outperformed has nothing to do with the story told, i.e. better covariance matrix, exploit, exploiting index hugging, or other contra trading strategies. It is simply that smart beta strategies embed exposure to value in small cap stocks, two traits known to have outperformed over time. End of quote. That's James Monier. He's a member of GMO's asset allocation team. And basically highlight, highlighting some very, very real truths about smart beta investing, really. And there's been papers on this, too, that, that highlight the same thing. In fact, a, a 2011 research, uh, research paper from a group of uh, researchers that actually are in the camp of smart beta even at make, make an admission saying that smart beta strategies inherently have value and small cap tilts to them relative to their cap weighted benchmark. So the point here, the point here is that smart beta is really just tilting the portfolio towards small and value stocks. So it's really an impressive branding story is what it is. It's not so much a new strategy there's nothing new about buying value stocks or buying small caps. Look at Warren Buffett. He's been buying value stocks for decades. And we know that these strategies have outperformed over time. The bigger question is, will smart beta, will small cap, will value stocks, which, which smart beta indexes and strategies tend to overweight? We know they've outperformed over the past. How will they do in the future? That's the more important question. We know that these strategies have been optimized in the financial laboratory. And we know that they've succeeded in the financial laboratory. But the real question is, will they be able to replicate? Will they be able to duplicate that same type of historical success in the real world? So regardless of how long a smart beta strategy has been back tested, the real test is how it performs in the future. 877-711. 5611, that is the number. We're here. Uh, if you want to talk about a particular stock, mutual fund, ETF, I'm game. Christian Magoon of the Yield Shares is coming up in the next segment. If you want to get in on our trivia question, uh, the question is, how did the S&P 500, how did U.S. stocks perform uh, December 8, 1941, on news that Jap the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor? Was it A, Stocks fell 8.2%, B, stocks fell 4.37%, or C, stocks rose 3.4%. So what is the answer? You've got a 1 in 3 chance of being right, and the caller, emailer, or tweeter with the right, uh, right answer will get a copy of my book, The Wall Street Coloring Book. If you have not gotten a copy of that, boy, we got... Uh, five out of five stars at Amazon.com. Everyone that's reviewed it absolutely loves it. Uh, also, my December ETF Profit Strategy newsletter is out, and it jam-packed with just uh, investment strategies. Got a global uh, map of all of the equity ETFs around the world, how they're performing, how they're doing. Really, you've got leading performance in the countries with the most aggressive central banks, Jap Japan and the U.S. leading the way uh, with 20% plus gains. And you've got uh, weakness in emerging market stocks pretty much continuing. Uh, you have had a little bit of a nice uh, rebound there with some of those stocks in Asia, like uh, China and also um, India. But some of those other country, uh, single country ETFs focused on Latin American countries like Brazil and uh, 
the like have really been underperformers in 2013, and they continue to underperform. 877-711-5611. That's the number. This is the Index Investing Show. I'll be right back. Meet Joe Investor. He's nice and he means well, but Joe Investor always misses the really big investment opportunities. For example, Joe Investor missed last year's 16% gain in small company stocks. And the year before that, he missed the 33% gain in long-term U.S. Treasury ETFs. And what about this year? Well, like all the times before, Joe Investor once again is all about lost opportunities and missed chances. Are you always missing out, just like Joe Investor? The Profit Strategy Newsletter at ETFguide.com will help you to stay on top of major investment trends so you never miss another big opportunity. Join today and get a $50 bonus by using promo code Joe50. Our monthly newsletter, our weekly picks, and our technical forecast will keep you ahead of the pack. Go to ETFguide.com to get started. And one more thing. Promise yourself to never, ever miss another big investment opportunity. Well, 2013 is just about over, and it's been a great year for stocks. On the other hand, not such a great year for bond investors. Here to talk with us about that and more is Christian Magoon. He's the founder of Yield Shares, ticker symbol YYY. We're pleased to have him with us. Christian, welcome back to the Index Investing Show. Thanks. Great to be here, Ron, and happy holidays to you and your listeners. Let's begin by talking about the 10-year U.S. Treasury yield, which is up an incredible 78% over the past year. Now, the yield on 10-year Treasuries, even at 2.85% in that vicinity, still doesn't produce an adequate income stream after taxes and after inflation. Talk about that. Yeah, you're exactly right, Ron. We're in a period of really historic low interest rates. And even though we've seen a, a rally in um, some of the uh, yields out there, still the absolute yields that um, are available for investors to try to create some type of uh, material investment uh, income are very, very thin. You know, there's a really a form of almost financial repression going on for income investors, people who are savers, and they're having to really begin looking elsewhere for alternative sources of investment income, uh, basically going beyond kind of traditional CDs, bonds, those types of fixed income instruments. Now let's talk about the Yield Shares ETF, ticker symbol YYY, listed on the NICE ARCA. It's had an incredible run since it was launched earlier this year. Now it's got an SEC 30-day yield of around 8.45%, and furthermore, it's easily beaten its peer, the PowerShares Closed-End Fund ETF. Tell us more. That's right. We uh, launched uh, YYY in uh, June of this uh, past year as a way for investors to receive high current income from an index of 30 closed-end funds that trade on the New York Stock Exchange. And essentially, if you're familiar with closed-end funds, you know that they're very similar to mutual funds, except they trade on an exchange and they have one, what we think is a feature that's very appealing. Their market price can actually trade above or below the value of the securities in the fund. So our index focuses on uh, closed end that are trading below the NAV of the underlying assets in their funds. So we're trying to buy closed end funds at a discount. It's a little bit of a contrarian strategy. So right now we're buying um, about a dollar's worth of fund assets. Uh, for 93 cents, about a 7% discount. And these are fund assets from firms like PIMCO, BlackRock, Nuveen, Eaton Vance, uh, not only bond closed-end funds, but equity closed-end funds. And uh, this philosophy really uh, seeks to try to maximize the current income for investors. And frankly, um, it's worked in the sense that YYY is ranked as the highest-yielding diversified ETF in the United States. If you're just joining us, you're listening to the Index Investing Show. Pleased to be talking with Christian Magoon, founder of the Yield Shares ETF, ticker symbol YYY. Yieldshares.com is the website. Check it out. Now, one of the emerging themes 
Looking ahead to 2014, is the Federal Reserve scaling back its massive QE program? Now, just how aggressively the Fed cuts back on its $85 billion in monthly Treasury bond purchases, nobody really knows. But what we do know is that the end is coming. So what type of impact or change will Fed tapering have on income investors? You know, in general, the Fed stepping out uh, or decreasing some of their bond purchases um, should mean less demand for in the bond market, which means that um, interest rates and, and um, uh, are, are likely to go upward. Um, as interest rates go upward, historically, um, fixed income investments like bonds um, uh, tend to go down. And one of the ways we kind of measure bond or bond funds' um, uh, potential risk to uh, a change in interest rates is you know, a, a measure called duration. And duration simply measures a fixed income's sensitivity to interest rates. And um, what we believe is that um, investors should really start to begin to pare down their exposure to long-duration bond funds or bond positions. And that would mean bond funds and bond positions that have the highest sensitivity to interest rates. Because should interest rates rise, should the Fed um, start to slow down or, or stop its, its purchases, um, long-duration um, investments will actually uh, be the most negatively impacted for just from a share price standpoint. So we think low-duration products are, are going to uh, be uh, very preferable for investors who still need income and maybe are still on that bond space uh, because, that again, they have less sensitivity to um, interest rates. The problem that some many investors find with lowering their duration in their income or their fixed income uh, area is that it also tends to produce lower yield um, to the shareholder. So we're seeing a variety of investors try to lower their duration in their fixed income bucket and then start to look outside um, the traditional bond space or CD space for other income options that have um, a very low duration but also produce a little bit higher income. So that's why I think we're seeing interest in, in master limited partnerships, uh, dividend paying stocks, uh, even uh, secondary uh, closed end funds like uh, YYY holds. Christian Magoon, founder of the Yield Shares, joining us. Yieldshares.com is the website. Go there. Now, there's been a lot of talk about how smart beta outperforms traditional market cap weighted indexes. What about the fact, though, that smart beta outperformance has nothing to do with better covariance matrix or other impressive explanations, but rather it's because that smart beta simply embeds market exposure to value and small cap stocks, two traits that have historically outperformed. Are we being sold an idea, well, really an old idea, in a new or different gift box wrapping? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, that's a that is a great way to, to put it. It's really like regifting. Um, you know, we've seen uh, historically um, a trend for outperformance in small cap stocks and value stocks, especially over longer periods of time. Um, really, the industry has kind of repackaged those individual performance factors into something you know called you know smart indexing or fundamental indexing. And what you really get is basically uh, products or indexes that are biased towards certain factors like small capitalization stocks or value stocks. So you're right, Ron. You're, you're exactly on, on the right trail there. It's simply factors being repackaged and in, in kind of remarketed in a new gift box uh, for this holiday season. So it's something important to, to uh, keep an eye on because just because maybe an investor owns smart beta doesn't mean that they may be actually experiencing or subject to concentration risks in certain sectors or certain investment styles. And, um, you know, the time to know that is before you uh, look into your portfolio and, and you realize that you have a heavy weighting to utilities stocks or to large cap uh, value stocks or to small cap stocks. So I think that's, uh, you know, something people should really keep an eye on and not get hoodwinked by uh, branding. Christian Magoon, founder of Yield Shares, joining us, yieldshares.com. One last thing before you take off. End of the year is exactly the time people should be reassessing the cost of their investments, the performance, taxes, looking at their investment portfolio, reflecting, reassessing. So what are things people should be doing right now with their investments this time of year in preparation of 2014? Okay, well, one thing that we've definitely been speaking with um, uh, financial advisors and investors about 
is looking at uh, their closed-end fund holdings or their bond fund holdings uh, where they may have had losses this year, especially if they owned uh, uh, taxable bonds. And um, tax loss harvesting is a beautiful thing. It's a chance for investors to sell uh, losing positions, take the tax loss on that position, and then you know probably redeploy those assets into either another area of the market or a similar product um, that that wouldn't uh, trigger uh, a wash sale rule, meaning um, something that's exactly similar than what you just um, um, actually sold and buying that exact same uh, security within 30 days. So we really think that uh, that's a great way to um, take advantage of the year-end kind of uh, tax uh, year coming. Do, look for ways you can uh, harvest tax losses in your portfolio. We're seeing a fair amount of interest in people who are doing some tax loss selling in individual closed-end funds or bond funds, taking those tax losses and redeploying those assets in YYY. What a great strategy, and this is the time of year to do that, tax loss harvesting. I know that those of you that own bond funds or bonds are sitting on some losses. It's been a tough year for bond investors, but you can turn your lemons into lemonade put YYY on your radar screen. Christian, great interview, and thanks for joining us. We'll catch up with you soon. Thanks, Ron. This is the Index Investing Show. I'm Ron DeLegge. I'll be right back. The Index Investing Show with Ron DeLegge. Seven 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 eleven fifty six eleven. Ron at indexshow.com is the email address. My Twitter handle at index show. If you ever miss our regular weekly radio broadcast, you can pick up our free podcast. It's available at YouTube. Just search under the Index Investing Show. You can also search for us on iTunes. Again, the Index Investing Show. So the trivia question is this. How did U.S. stocks react after the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor on December 8, 1941? Did stocks A fall? Did they fall A down 8.2%, B down 4.37%, or C were they up 3.4%? Let's go to the phone lines. We've got Fred in Concord, California. Welcome to the program. Hi, Ron. Nice to have you with us. Yeah, I think it went down 8.2. I think it's a no-brainer, whatever the maximum is, uh, what what possibly else could have happened. You are you have overshot, Fred, and uh, that is oh. not the correct answer. But uh, a good guess, nevertheless. So that leaves open two possibilities for another caller, 877-711-5611. What was it? Was it down 4.37% or up 3.4%? Now, you had another question that you wanted to get into. Talk about that. Yes, well, it's it's not really related to that, but I'm wondering why would it, would it work or would it not work to have a currency that consists only of coins, precious metal, Silver, gold, platinum, stainless, real nickel, real copper, no paper whatsoever, which paper wears out in two to three years. Coins last a minimum of 30 years. The coins would all back themselves up. The paper is just a promissory note, and who believes that there's really money to back it up? gold or precious metal to back it, back it up. Why would that not work, or why would it work in, a, in any economy anywhere in the world? Well, it, it's not going to work because the governments and the central banks aren't going to make it work. That's why it's not going to work, Fred. And it's, <laughs> it's, it's, not, it's not a novel idea. I mean, it's been tried before. And, you know, let me remind you, I'm, I'm not necessarily uh, against that. But I'm also not a an, an hyper-radical, anti-fiat currency type. I'm not that. But what I will say, Fred, is that uh, this society, there's no will to do this because of the fact that the central banks don't want it, the government doesn't want it, there's no account, financial accountability whatsoever. And, um, you know, the gold standard, we haven't had that since 1971. 
the year that I was born, and I don't think we're going back to it, quite frankly. Then now there's been talk, and I think this could possibly make sense, is is a, a blended approach where you maybe back half of the currency by physical assets like gold or silver or what have you. I think that could possibly work, but going straight or cold turkey and saying everything is backed by gold and we're all going to convert to coins, I don't know how practical, especially with the, this particular society, which happens to be a paperless society, we're, we're moving in that direction, how they're going to be dealing with coins. So it's a, it's a nice suggestion, but I, I just don't know how practical it is. Thanks for the call. Let's go to Kathy in Santa Rosa, California. Welcome to the program. Hi. Hello? Yes, you're live. Hi. Hello. Talk Hello. to us. Um. Oh, my guess would be that it went up only because bad news is usually good news for the market. Oh, my goodness. This group is horrible. Nice guess, Kathy, but that's not it. How did U.S. stocks react after the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor on December 8, 1941? That was a good guess. Thank you for the call, Kathy, but that was not the answer. Let's go to the phone lines. I guess this is our last. This is Fred again. Fred, you're back. <laughs> yes. Um, I just want to let you know I got somehow got cut off. I didn't hang up rudely. <laughs> yes, continue with your thought about currency. Well, yes, and what what I would what my objective is 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 that the, the coins would back themselves up. So there's no more of this false promises. And then, ultimately, there would be no plastic either. So, I, I mean, I think ideal society had would have no debt. You can't possibly have no debt with no plastic. I mean, if there were ever a, 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 a holocaust and uh, only the survivors were the desert people or the boom people out in the boonies, we started a new country, you were the new czar, president, emperor, or at least financial uh, guru, and it was left up to you, wouldn't it make sense, starting all over again, which is, I think, how this country started in the first place. No plastic, no promissory, all coins, no such thing as credit. You actually won't buy anything unless you have the money to buy it. The country of Fred. The country. I, <laughs> no, the country of Ron. No, the country of Fred. Again, this is this is not going to happen, Fred. I mean, these are all ideological arguments, and they may, they sound good on paper. They sound good on paper. They make sense on paper. But are you going to really be able to convert a society that that wants paper, that wants loose credit, that likes to borrow, that likes to overspend, that likes to go in debt? See, I think this is something that you have to apply at a personal level. I think this is a great financial plan personally for everyone that listens to this show and everyone in general that we should be applying in our own personal finances. But to get everyone on the same program is not going to happen because people don't want this. They're, 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 the, the masses want to overspend. They want loose credit. And that, that's, that's just a fact of life. And, uh, you know, but now for the rest of us, we should be practicing this we should never be overspending. We should never buy things that we can't afford. And I think that's the way to do it. Now, from a hedging perspective, you know, we've seen the U.S. dollar lose its value tremendously. So how do you hedge against that? Well, you got to diversify. You can't altogether go cold turkey and abandon, abandon fiat currencies and say, well, I'm going to go live in a cave. I'm going to eat cold porridge and I'm going to be trading fur pelts as a form of exchange. We can't do that. It's not reasonable. We still have to work and live within a fiat currency world. Now, I know the hyper radicals, they want you to do that. They want you to be miserable like them. They want you to go live in a field like, a, like an animal. Uh, of course, they don't, want, they, don't, they don't want to do that themselves, do they? They don't want to make that sacrifice themselves. They want everyone else to do it. You know, the Peter Schiff types. Oh, buy gold, buy silver. 
You know, they want you to to, to have 100% of everything you do based around that. And meanwhile, they're not doing it themselves. Aren't they a bunch of hypocrites? But I think the key here is to, to obviously to diversify one's assets. Don't have all of your money geared towards paper assets and especially dollar assets. And you can also, by the way, uh, get this type of diversification by owning the index funds that we're talking about. Like, for example, these foreign funds that own foreign equities, foreign bonds are are in local currencies of these various nations. So you're getting indirect exposure to, well, secondary exposure to these, these currencies. So in, in a sense, you're diversifying not just your, your securities exposure, but also your currency exposure away from the U.S. dollar. We have to end there, uh, Fred. Great conversation, and uh, we'll pick that up and, and continue that uh, again in the future. If you'd like to send me a, an email, comment, question, Ron at IndexShow.com. You can also pick up my uh, latest ETF Profit Strategy newsletter, which is out for December. Go to ETFGuide.com and click on the Profit Strategy newsletter. And when you do, use promo code TRADEUP and you'll get a $50 discount. If you'd like to follow me on Twitter, at IndexShow is my Twitter handle. Coming up on next week's program, Charles Ellis, author of of winning the loser's game timeless strategies for successful investing you will not want to miss that interview he's a giant charles ellis that does it join us again next week this is the index investing show The opinions expressed in this broadcast are not necessarily that of our advertisers, sponsors, or broadcast partners. The discussion of investing is general and should not be construed as investment advice or an offer to buy or sell securities. Listeners are responsible for their own investment decisions and results. Before investing in mutual funds or ETFs, always consult a prospectus for risk, charges, expenses, and other information. Read the prospectus carefully before investing. Past performance is not indicative of future results. No reproduction or dissemination of the index investing shows permitted without the expressed written consent of its producers.